Hey everybody, this is the Couch Report uh, brought to you by Relics. I'm RJ. Um, as you can see, I'm joined by a panel of distinguished guests. Um, over here you have Matt and Tom. Hey everyone. <laughs> this is Jesse Lauder, uh, Benji Eisen, and Mike Fenoya. So um, thanks to Relics, thanks to Jonathan Healy for making this happen, and thanks to the staff here at the Brooklyn Bowl of Vegas. We are really lucky to be recording here in the afternoon. We actually look um, professional up here, and um, it looks like we know what we're doing. I don't Speak think. Speak for yourself. I think they're <laughs> collective, collective ten hours of sleep. Probably everything should the, be in quotes. Yeah, we look yeah. professional <laughs> up here. It's as professional as you can get at, at noon um, in the, in the afternoon here. But um, so we're going to talk about uh, the fish concert last night. Cast Vot Voxed I rock. Um, I don't know what the hell happened. I'm still confused. Um, Jesse, can you start us off and tell us what happened? Sure. Uh, <laughs> we, we learned of a, uh, that, that there, there was a band, a very obscure band in uh, Scandinavia in the early 80s uh, called Casvat Vax that, you know, seems that very, very few people knew about this band. So, so obscure that not even the greatest of record diggers could, you know, find their, their music anywhere. But no, I, uh, Fish did something very cool in the tradition that sort of has existed in rock and roll for a long time, like the Beatles with Sgt. Pepper, I thought of XTC and the Dukes of Stratosphere. Um, and uh, now we have Casvalt Vaxxed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. Benji, what, what, what was your take on last night? What, how did you react when you saw the playbill and, and sort of going into it before the music started? Well, I was ambivalent. I thought uh, going into it, and that, well, one, I knew that it was going to be amazing. You know, I just had that faith. Uh, and they didn't disappoint on that front. But uh, in this age of fake news, you know, you're reading it and it's like, we're now so conditioned to question the reality of everything. And I mean, I've definitely questioned reality at a fish show once or twice before, <laughs> so, so, so it was perfect. You know, I, I loved it. And what about the, the music itself? Um, I guess maybe, maybe Tom, you could, you could comment on this. I know that you got a lot of questions about the songs and whether they were songs that you and you and Trey had done or or whether they were your lyrics or whether you had anything to do with it but what's what's the answer i mean you do have this the swedish background but i don't think this was a a, a marshall family creation <laughs> well i immediately tried to translate with the little swedish that i have the title and the second word vox kind of se seemed like it was related to the swedish word sharp so nothing at all like faceplant into rock. <laughs> so uh, that was my first clue that something fishy was going on. Yeah. And uh, really, um, to answer your question, I just kind of came away, well, right away, I was immensely appreciative of their full head over heels commitment to the gag. I mean, everything was white, and down to the guitar stands and the chords and the monitors and even the cameras that they normally have up there. They were white. Yeah. I, I want a furry Moog. Like, did you see pages two cents? They were both furry. Yes, they are covered it. with furry white things. And I think Mike had an abbreviated bass cabinet wrapped in white material. I mean, yeah. it was just amazing. Everywhere I looked, the, the guitar stands were white. The, every possible little thing. And then Mike uh, called for his guitar tech at one yeah. point to come out, his bass tech. He was dressed in he white. Was dressed yeah. in white. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that doesn't answer you musically, which is a whole other realm that we can get into. But to answer your lyric question, um, I was kind of baffled and stunned. And looking at my 40-year songwriting companion up there, searching for clues of, I mean, they wrote this stuff, right? It has to be them. And uh, you know, trying to find, is there anything that would give it away, especially for me, that Trey was involved, but somehow they put it through their 80s Scandinavian band filter, and they really, really pulled off an amazing, amazing gag. Beautiful. I, beautiful. I love that you knowing them as well as you do, I love that they fooled you, kind of, and that you had to, you know, continue to question it. Yeah. Questioned it the whole time, absolutely. And uh, no, I had nothing to do with the lyrics. In fact, um, I went on a songwriting trip with Trey kind of before their rehearsal for this, and he even pulled a, pulled a fast one on me. He said, we're really still not sure what we're going to be doing. <laughs> nice. well, so he might, he might have been right about that. 
That was the only yeah. truth in this whole thing. <laughs> so, Mike, I want to ask you, you're, you're a comedian. You, do, you, you go up and do performances for a living. Yeah. What, what, what was your take on the sort of misdirection and the, the, the act itself? Well, I thought it was fantastic. The, the funniest thing all night was right when the curtain came up, a guy a couple rows up from me goes, uh, oh, the whole band's dressed like Mike for Halloween, <laughs> which was great. That cracked me up. But um, I thought it was, it just showed that, um, that trust that they have in us and the, the trust that we have in them that no matter what, it's going to be a fantastic experience, like you were saying. Going in and just being like, it's my favorite band. Um, I had to miss the first set, and I'm missing the first set of all the shows because I'm, I'm doing comedy here. So I was texting my friends, do not send me a picture <laughs> of the fish bill. And my buddy goes, dude, you've never heard of it. And he like sent me this angry kind of like people were like this is bullshit that yeah. they would do this like people were getting mad people and were angry. it's people, not real people always get mad but I, I think going back to what you said going into it this is our favorite band well going back to wingsuit and Tom you and I talked about this before with wingsuit it, for me my 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 uh, context for it was wait a minute it's not going to be my dad's favorite classic rock album but it's going to be my favorite band of all time playing a brand new album that I've never heard. Well, what's not to love about that? A lot of people didn't, though. And so, but, but then, so then Fish comes out and does with Chilling Thrilling, where it's, they realize that their fans will love it if it's a cover album of original Fish material. And now they... Silence. Hey, everybody. This is The Couch Report, uh, brought to you by Relics. I'm RJ. Uh, I had nothing to do with the lyrics. They were white. I, I want a furry Moog. Was involved, but somehow they put it through their 80s Scandinavian band filter, and they really, really pulled off an amazing, amazing gag. Beautiful. I, I love that you knowing them as well as you do, I love that they fooled you kind of, and that you had to you know, continue to question it. Yeah. Questioned it the whole time, absolutely. And uh, no, I had nothing to do with the lyrics. In fact, um, I went on a songwriting trip with Trey kind of before their rehearsal for this, and he even pulled a, pulled a fast one on me. He said, we're really still not sure what we're going to be doing. <laughs> nice. well, so he might, he might have been right about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only yeah. truth in this whole thing. <laughs> so, Mike, I want to ask you, you're, you're a comedian. You, do, you, you go up and do performances for a living. Yeah. What, what, what was your take on the sort of misdirection and the, the, the act itself? Well, I thought it was fantastic. The, the funniest thing all night was right when the curtain came up, a guy a couple rows up from me goes, uh, oh, the whole band's dressed like Mike for Halloween, <laughs> which was great. That cracked me up. But um, I thought it was, it just showed that, um, that trust that they have in us and the, the trust that we have in them that no matter what, it's going to be a fantastic experience, like you were saying, going in and just being like, it's my favorite band. Um, I had to miss the first set, and I'm missing the first set of all the shows because I'm doing my I'm doing comedy here. So I was texting my friends, "Do not send me a picture <laughs> of the fish bill." And my buddy goes, "Dude, you've never heard of it." And he like sent me this angry kind of like people were like, "This is bullshit that yeah. they would do this." Like people were getting mad. People and were angry. It's people, not real. People always get mad, but I, I think going back to what you said, going into it, this is our favorite band. Well, going back to Wingsuit, and Tom, you and I talked about this before. With Wingsuit, it, for me, my, my, my uh, context for it was, wait a minute, it's not going to be my dad's favorite classic rock album, but it's going to be my favorite band of all time playing a brand new album that I've never heard. Well, what's not to love about that? A lot of people didn't, though. And so, but, but then, so then Fish comes out and does with Chilling Thrilling, where it's, they realize that their fans will love it if it's a cover album of original Fish material. And now they figured out that if it's a, ba a, a cover band of a cover album of original Fish material, it's even better. The, the thought of going up and doing an entire 10 songs that have never been heard as another band, kind of, sort of, maybe, it's just unreal. Like the, the confidence that they have in themselves to trust fall into each other. That's just wild. The thought of going up and telling a new joke that maybe kind of works is 
petrifying, <laughs> you know, for them to be able to go and just pull this off last night don't was unreal. Don't you think, though, that that means that they've been dangling these songs in front of yes, us for the entire right. tour, the whole tour, and now we'll go back and listen, and we'll be yeah. like, oh, yeah. I agree with that 100%. Well, that's, I mean, that's what's remarkable is, like, the pre-planning. We always think about, you know, throughout fall tour, what songs are they jamming? Are they hinting at a sound that they're rehearsing? But in this case, the attention to detail went back to blog posts that they put up on the internet, little breadcrumbs that have been dropped everywhere, um, you know, the, the amazing Fishbill liner notes, which were not like written in a comedic tone or anything. It was dead serious. That this album I, I, was so I important. was fooled until, it, like, basically until the beginning of the second set. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I texted Jesse Jarno. I was like, who, you know, would, would know this record, right? <laughs> And he, he was fooled as well, I'm, you know. I'm surprised he hasn't been listening to them for years. Yeah, no. <laughs> right. Well, so, Jesse, you, um, we had had, we had planned to have you on this to talk about whatever album they were going to cover right. because we were like... <laughs> I didn't get Electric Ladyland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you were like, whatever they cover, I'll probably have some familiarity with it, but this was the, 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 nope. the one that, that didn't work. I'm not going to say Curveball. Um, shit, sorry. You could say curveball. Um, it is. It what was what a did you ball. hear musically? Like, this is Scandinavian rock, but we heard a lot of different influences, a lot of different sort of styles of music. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys, maybe starting with you, Jesse, if you heard any, um, like, What's the last song called? Passing Through or something? That sounded yeah, like Graceland. Um, it, it jumped all over the place. The thing that I liked, you mentioned, uh, uh, Tom, the the uh, crew member in the, the white suit. I, I love the different production references. Like that to me was totally Neil Young, Russ Never Sleeps. Obviously like them like running to the side of the stage like Bruce Springsteen in the yeah, East yeah. Street Band. Yeah. Um, my, I had a friend who pointed out very aptly that it was like their suits were kind of like the hives, that Australian mm. band. Right, um, yeah. I also thought it was sort of like a, I, I, my favorite uh, meme fish bill I saw was someone put up Autobahn Noggle Bet from The Big Lebowski as being the record, <laughs> and it kind of was that. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, <laughs> so I enjoyed the production elements, you know, oh, uh, um, I, I, those references. The music sounded like fish. I thought. I thought actually, if I was to criticize it, I thought they could have, even though it was, even though it wasn't them being Cosmod Vax, it was fish. Playing Cosvat Vax, that that's the the whole meta thing with this, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I do wish that they sort of did the character a little bit more. I wish there were like more well, vocoder vocoders. I wish there was more '80s production elements, but which which I did hear at certain points. Um, but yeah, it was it, it sounded like fish to me. If they didn't get dressed up at all and just came out and played that, would you have loved it? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the thing we talked about this earlier, Tom. Like the 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 meta thing or the gag within the gag was that eventually through the set it did sound like fish was playing covering this album right remember <laughs> it's fish covering exactly. this band yeah. so exactly. it's so cool. once the jams start it's fish yes yeah but it's fish's interpretation of this norwegian band and al of also like seeing them play that without Kuroda's like those squares that were hanging from that was so cool that yeah. was really neat and it was like there were moments that like i kind of with my eyes closed, was seeing what I thought Kuroda would when he would have like lit the yeah. place up, but it wasn't happening. No, and that no. was a really it, yeah. Neat, it was like, it was point. simultaneously dated in terms of the sound, but it was very modern production. Well, like they, I felt they, like they, Kia they on acid turned, up there. They kind of turned yeah. the entire arena into a Euro dance hall, you know, like a yeah. disco uh, right. disco tech. And I loved that, you know, like because uh, it was just like it was a dance party, and I imagined that like. You know, I mean, I obviously don't know, but I imagine that Trey has had a, a fantasy more than once in his life where he's, you know, like, uh, as a rock star, he's the, playing the European discotheque, you know, like, yeah. uh, <laughs> circuit. And also, shout out to the Eric Clapton signature, uh, yeah. White Stratocaster, that was awesome. Also proves that Trey can make any guitar sound it, like Trey. Yeah. It sounded exactly yeah. like him. It really did, even though it was a different guitar. That version of guitar you mentioned was the Radiohead version? I th yeah, I think somebody, uh, our friend Ryan, who does Trey's guitar, I think he said it's the Ed O'Brien oh, version. Oh, it, it's um, okay. Which it's, there, I, I felt a little bit of Radiohead influence throughout, uh, throughout the evening. I know Ed O'Brien was at the last Vegas show. I think they're all probably big fans. Hmm. Um, so in terms of the modernness, you know, it felt like you could have been seeing a Radiohead show or the, the Killers or the Hives or some modern band with a big arena production. Some of the crazy details that you might not have noticed were Trey's guitar strings were white. And uh, the symbols right. were white. Yeah. And the symbols were white and didn't really sound like symbols. Yeah. They sounded like spray-painted symbols yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have that edge. 
Which is probably why symbols the, aren't white. The glow you know, in the dark donuts on Fishman's but with, grass. With Trey on that guitar, it goes back to what he said in the guitar world, uh, or maybe the guitar player, in a magazine interview in the 90s. Trey said the tone is in the fingertips. And I was thinking about that last yeah. night because it was absolutely right. I mean, he could have been playing a PV, solid state, you yeah. know, whatever. And it, it, last night he proved it sounds like him. Yeah. yeah. He it's, doesn't hide. It's amazing. And so this is sort of classic, maybe the, the most classic fish misdirection, right, that we've, that we've seen. I mean, we've seen... I remember in 2013, I thought, and I think others thought, that Wingsuit was like a gag because of the song names, 555, and other, you know, we're like, this can't be real. And then in this case, finally, it's like, this can't be real, but it was, but it still wasn't. That actually wasn't yeah. a Vagoda on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I was like racking my brains for, you know, any gag that came close, and this surpasses them all, I think. So, Tom, did you, do you, uh, I know that people on, on, online have said that they heard some of your influence on the lyrics, or, or some of you, did you hear your own influence on the lyrics? Because I know there were a couple of phrases that people were like, that has to be Tom Marshall. What was the Santos lyric? Uh, um, say it to me, Santos. Say it to me, yeah, someone, I, I have some real and smart the, Twitter followers, yeah. and they, this morning was really entertaining, and uh, a lot of them pulled out, <laughs> pulled out lyrics that they were 100% sure were mine. And I've already given away or told that yeah. I had nothing to do with the this. Glue in, My I mean, the glue in your magnet? That was, that was one too. of yeah, them? That, that was supposedly me as well. But I had absolutely nothing to do with the, Norwegian, And that also an speaks to... There's a Norwegian Tom. There's a Norwegian Tom. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Well, so that sort of speaks to this amazing um, uh, tweet that I got from one of my followers, Lee Farber. Um, what if Kosvot Voxt was pretending to be fish this whole time? Is this your 35-year secret? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's yes. awesome. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not the answer, answer, like, to start answers, thinking yes. about that. So um, I think maybe one of the last questions here, Matt, maybe you can start. Do you, what do you think is going to happen with this material? Like, is this, is this fodder for additional jams? Will we see these songs again? I hope so. I mean, just, you know, I think we have a little bit more of a concrete idea about that because of the chilling thrilling thing that those did become a part of the repertoire um, and I was listening we were listening earlier in the in the hotel room and decoupling the songs from the production it was easy to hear how these are going to get integrated um, you know Tommy mentioned some of the jams got to a very fishy place last night to me that's the most important part the, what's going to be the lasting legacy of this set and the influence on their sound moving forward and I'm excited about it what about you Jesse um, I think the final hurrah will be the one that people will want yeah. to hear the most. Um, I will say that Ayo, I... Ayo? <laughs> the way Ayo chorus yeah, at the end? Yeah, <laughs> And uh, uh, We Are Come to Outlive Our Brains is by far, I'm sorry, Tom, the greatest song title for a fish song ever. Sorry, Cosbot Bax. Yeah. It, yeah, I was thinking all our bass belong to us, but yeah. We Are Come to Outlive Our Brains. I was like, wow. <laughs> What about you, Benji? Do you, see, do you see this material coming back? Well, I mean, if Fish was the coolest band on the planet, which they might be, what I first see them doing was as either leaving it alone for the New Year's around kids. They, they kind of just do these four shows. It's New Year's. It's kind of like a, an island into itself. And then in the summer tour, you, you break it out. Although, on the other hand, if they wanted to set the tone, they could come out and do it as, the, as the, you know, one of these songs as the, as the run opener. Yeah. But I, I kind of wish that they would leave it alone just for the four shows. And then in the summertime, come, come on stand with a, with a few of the fan favorites. Right on. Or their favorites. Mike, do you agree? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I would like to, there's a couple tunes in there that I want them to continue to explore. Hell yeah. You know? Like, I mean, yeah. uh, Death Doesn't Hurt for a Long Time or whatever the hell that was called. <laughs> that, that song was, I mean, that was fire. Speaking from experience. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought that, I think that they've got a lot of incredible vehicles. I'm excited to see where they go with it, for sure. I hope they don't abandon it, but... Yeah. I think you're right. Give it a breather. Is there a Cosbot Faxed yeah. album that's going to be dropped on us? I mean, that, that is a good oh, wow. that's a Are good they gonna, Are they going to do the wall tonight? Is that the, is that the thing? <laughs> <laughs> right. 20 years later right. to the day? Right. Yeah, we, maybe we'll hear those uh, faceplant into rock samples dropped into jams tonight right. and through the rest of the run. Probably, yeah. So we want to get you guys back to your, your days, and we're going to have another uh, special Sleep. guest, Mark Brownstein, come up here in a second. But just a quick lightning round. What's your overall takeaway? Like one, one or two takeaways from last night, or one takeaway from last night? First of all, I think that the sound in this place is unreal. It felt like Boardwalk Hall, where it like punched me right in the face. I love how loud the venue is. There's a ton of space. Everybody was super cool. And I really like what Kuroda had the chance to play around with, with those rhombus looking orby things up yeah. and hanging in the sky and I'd like to see that turn into something yeah. I think it all it opened up a big channel for a lot of new things for us 
So. Benji? Uh, after Curveball, I feel like the, the community needed something like this, and I feel that Fish hit this fucking out of the park. Can I say that? I, I just like, yeah, I you do, you already did. Too late. Well, anyway, so I, I feel like they hit it out of the park, and <laughs> they proved to me, as they often do, again and again, why, why they're my favorite band. Yep. You know, they, they, uh, they're not predictable. Even when you think you can predict their unpredictability, <laughs> right. you know, and, right, and right, they, right. They th I, mean, I, I know it's a, it might sound weird now, but they, they do throw curveballs, yep. you know, and that's what they do best, yep. and, and I love them for it. Yep. Jesse? I, I think, like I said to you the other week when we talked about Albany, the vocals are getting better, and if they're singing well, their playing is only going to be better. And I think, aside from the the um, the album, I think that was the best first tube ever played last night. I, I I'll put that out there. That really and uh, it was a travel day for everyone. I think the energy was like a little weird in the room for yeah. a bit, and then people were you know a little, uh, you know, confused. Yeah. But you know, all signs pointing that the rest of the run is going to be pretty special. Cool. Um, Tom, one takeaway for you. Again, the commitment to the gag is just yeah. the overarching thing for me is just how incredibly uh, committed to uh, pulling this off and, and how long they must have kept the secret and how long they must have known about this and jamming in secret and writing all these songs in secret. It's just like, you know, Fish surprises me 40 years later, 33 years later, whatever, always. And, yeah. and so much so that it shouldn't be a surprise, and yet it always is. It still is. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, in addition to everything that you guys said, I'll add two things. Um, one, let's not skip over the first and third sets, which were both fantastic. The first set in particular, uh, uh, amazing the Haley's Comet. The the how, they had that, how did they have that energy? The song, exactly. The song I heard the ocean sing was incredible. Yes, yeah. really awesome. So um, really great stuff there. And then I, you know, I can't speak for everybody else. I love seeing Rockstar Trey every once in a while. It's cool to see him get up on the monitors and yeah. play a big solo. Yeah, he was uh, it. If you it, it's light perusing of the internet this morning, it seemed like the ladies like that. So um, <laughs> if you're if you're a lady who loves who loves Trey, uh, it seems like this was the the show for you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we're gonna bring Mark Brownstein up here. So thanks, Mike. Thanks, Benji. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, this did it. Um, all right, so uh, thanks to our, our previous guests, to Benji and Jesse and Mike. And we are here with another special guest, Mark Brownstein uh, from the Disco Biscuits, Star Kitchen, co-founder of, of Headcount, all, of, all kinds of projects. How you doing, Mark? I am doing great. <laughs> I'm just totally woke up, a little bit confused, yeah. trying to reprocess the night through the lens of what actually happened. <laughs> How um, did you feel about it at the time as it was happening? Well, you know, somebody said it was a travel day yesterday, so we got up so early in Philadelphia, and we came out all the way there, and uh, there were all the rumors of what the album was going to be, and then you come in, and you get the playbill, and you have to go through this. Now you're tired, even to begin with. You have to go through the process of trying to figure out if this is real or if this is a gag. Um, and they did such a good job of planting stuff on the internet that everybody in the row was saying, oh, I see something right here on all music. There's a <laughs> description of this band. This could yeah. be real. Uh, but um, a as it unfolded, I was there with Aaron, the keyboard player from the Disco Biscuits, and we were talking consistently through the album with little tidbits like, this can't, this can't be <laughs> real, right? This can't this be real. has to be fish. And like you said, it sounded so much like fish that I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that this wasn't actually something that they had written. But uh, I had convinced myself somehow that fish is so terrific at making, taking anybody's songs and making it sound like their own that there was this, this off chance that that is what had happened. And of course, look, there's so much obscure prog rock out there that none of us do know about, that it's not beyond the realm of the doubt that there would be a weird album from 1981 that none of us have ever heard about. Yeah. Calling Jesse Jarnow was a really smart, that was a smart decision, <laughs> you know. But um, I didn't know what to think when it was happening. One thing I knew was that I, th I thought that the songs were too good for this to have not been something that we all knew already. That was a thought that kept going through my mind. That was like, we'd hit one of the great songs, be like, this is just so well written. The chord progressions are right on the money. Yep. 
Um, Plus, and then, like, a, like ABBA, right? ABBA in the 80s was like the big thing from Scandinavia. This thing kind of couldn't, they were probably searching for stuff, you know, from Scandinavia in the 80s. This couldn't have remained obscure, although I guess a lot of albums got thrown into a fjord. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one thing we should say is, Mark, you, this is your, your, the first of two appearances on this stage uh, today. You guys will be playing here tonight, tomorrow night, and whatever the day after that is, right? Three Correct. nights. Three nights here. <laughs> three nights the next here. three nights, we're, we're Do you want us to stay here? Right like this? Yeah, we can just it would sit be here. Perfect. We can work around you guys. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, I guess one thing we should say is that those shows will be um, webcasts. Um, so for folks who are watching this uh, right before the fish show, you can watch the biscuits later. And, and for those of you who are in Vegas, um, come hang out. But um, Mark, I've seen you tweet before that like before Fish shows that you're about to go see your favorite band, and I think you're pretty like outspoken about the fact that, that you love Fish. And what it, what is it like to be able to kind of participate in both going to the shows and then playing and kind of being part of this whole experience? Well, as a w one of the things about the music scene is that I, I think now everybody has accepted that Fish is incredible and even the musicians who don't come directly from the jam band scene have ha, have clued in to the fact that fish is great but there was a time when it wasn't cool to like fish if you were a musician mm -hmm. it kind of they, they put you into the less than box if you were like one of the fish heads that was a musician um but you know kind of like with uh kind of like with cannabis reform and, and other issues, sometimes if you want to change the, the impression that people have of something, you have to take it on yourself to, to be that person who has the courage to stand up and say, I like this band more than any other band. Mm -hmm. Fish is my favorite band. So uh, there was a time where you know people would even tell me, like, maybe you want to tone down the Fish is your favorite band thing if you want to be in a jam band. I've been, I've been told that. It's not <laughs> such a great... It's not such a great look. And to me, the best look is just to be honest and to be yourself. And if you're not being yourself, then you're not being, you know, then you're disingenuous. And yeah. what's that in art? That doesn't come across well in art at all. So, you know, uh, we have, the Disco Biscuits have a ton of influences from all over the musical spectrum, um, just like Fish does. We have a lot of the same influences that Fish has, mm -hmm. which is probably one of the reasons that we were drawn to them. And I, I say we, Fish is my favorite band. It's, it, it's not everybody in the Disco Biscuits' yeah. favorite band. Obviously, they all respect and love the band. But, um, but you know, I was, uh, um, I was the wook in the crowd, you know, like... <laughs> They say. Thanks for standing up and being counted, Mark. You know, <laughs> I, I just feel like, you know, when I was a young kid, they, they always said, just be yourself, right? Yeah. And if you just be yourself, everything will work out, yeah. right? Yeah, and it seems yeah. to be, yeah, that's a really good point. So, so, Mark, you were talking about, you know, obviously the, the influence of Fish and starting the Disco Biscuits, but then the, the Disco Biscuits sound kind of took a turn and veered into more of the electronic dance space. Um, you were sharing with me before we talked here about how that's kind of come full circle with your new project, Star Kitchen. Could you, you know, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, one of the things... One of the things about being in a band is you have to sound like your own band or it's not going to, there's no, going to be no staying power. None of the bands that sounded exactly like Fish from 1994, 1995, 1996 are still around. It just, it's not a thing. You can't mimic somebody else and have a career. So, one, so very early on, we thought to ourselves, we have to change what we're doing. We have to bring other elements into this. We were playing Grateful Dead and Santana and Fish songs, and, uh, but we really liked electronic music. We were hanging out at these parties, and so we started to bring that element in. And around 1997, 1998, it started to be its own thing. Um, and, and so much to the point where, just like with Fish, there's then all of these baby biscuit bands popped up that sound exactly like the biscuits and you know one or two of them have gone on to you know have their own sound so I, what I was telling you was in 1997 when we were kind of veering off into our own world and getting deep into the electronic world I ran into Mike one night and uh he invited me to come onto the bus. The, the fish bus was parked in the, in the middle of the road and like Ben Franklin Parkway, they were staying up at the Four Seasons and, or, or the Ritz or whatever. And uh, we went out onto the bus and they were doing all of the fish had just changed dr dramatically. Now you guys are talking earlier about having faith in your fan base. 
these guys had ridden this one style of music all the way to selling out Madison Square Garden, and then they dramatically changed the style over which they were jamming. And for me, a couple of my friends, it lost us. There was a moment where we were like, oh, wow, that's that, while they were gaining a whole new generation of fans were coming on and the fish funk was the greatest and the, 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 the most incredible thing that anybody had ever heard. Um, and we were kind of veering off in a different direction. My, I had this incredible, incredible experience as a fish fan where Mike brought me in and sat me down in the back of the bus and we had a bowl and he put on this James Brown video and explained to me that Fishman was coming in after every single show and they'd get into the back of the bus and he'd put this James Brown funk video on and he would make them watch the video the whole entire (laughs) night and then what they would do is they'd go on stage and they would just try to mimic it exactly like every night they were like we're just so he's like that's really what's going on on this tour I asked him what's going on the tour you guys are playing funk like It's like every jam sounds just like this thing. And he's like, here it is. Let me show it to you. And it was just an eye-opening moment where I was kind of let into into the thinking of how a band was creatively doing something. And he then took me up. We went back to his hotel room, and we jammed a little bit, and he... uh, played me the Grey Boy All-Stars. He introduced me to the Grey, Grey Boy All-Stars at the time and was like, this is my favorite band. Uh, you should really get into it. And I kind of took this all, the James Brown video and the Grey Boy All-Stars video, and I stored it all in a box. Went off, had a whole career, and then about two or three years ago, I had some time. Uh, and I was, I, w- I was going to Jazz Fest with my wife, and I came off of like a week in Jazz Fest, and I came home and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back now and pick up, take, take the Grey Boy All-Stars and James Brown, put it up, make a huge Spotify playlist and go through and learn all of the songs and learn the style and kind of just to become a better bass player. The idea was if, Mike 20, if my favorite bass player 20 years ago was telling me, hey, this is great, you should learn this, I should probably do it. And uh, I did it. I started to really get into that stuff. And, and, and I met some guys in, in Philly who are totally pro musicians. One uh, is a guitar player who plays with Eric Krasno uh, in the Eric Krasno band. And he plays, he plays with the Soul Live guys, Alan Evans. His name is Danny Mayer. And Rob Marsher is the keyboard player. He plays with Jennifer Hartswick's band. And, uh, and we, we found a church drummer named Marlon Lewis from West Philly who's unbelievable. And we put a funk band together called Star Kitchen, sort of in the vein of, of this music that I came back around to learn 20 years later. That's amazing. That's really cool. Yeah, and, and people should check out Star Kitchen. Obviously, you're you're still still touring with the Biscuits, and and you guys are playing a lot of runs. I know in, in the next playing New Year's, right? Yeah, we um, have we have a we have we're playing here in Vegas this weekend, and then the Palace in Albany for Thanksgiving. We're doing Colorado and Mexico in, in December, and that leads up to New Year's four nights in Philadelphia. And we're we've done New York so many years in a row now. Uh, and it was kind of a leap of faith for us to say, should we be this close to where Fish is right here, but it's our hometown, yep. and we were like, let's do four nights in Philly. It's, we're really excited about That's great. it. So uh, the last question, we really appreciate you taking the time. I know you got a busy day, so we'll, we'll let you go, especially because people want to get on this stage to start Trying setting to set up Trying to set us your, up. <laughs> set you up. But let's talk about headcount. I'd see your, 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 your shirt is... Uh, is you know, I know you're, you're an advocate. You're an advocate for a lot of things, but... Um, Headcount is is really cool and, and just such a um, an important I think vehicle in, in this jam band community and, and music community and beyond to get people engaged and I know you founded it with Andy Bernstein right um, can you just tell us a little bit about how it started and also like how it's evolved Yeah well it started in 2000 in late 2003 Andy called me and uh, there was a lot of frustration uh, just. It, a general sense that within the jam band community there was a lot of political apathy, that we were never really hearing anything at that time. Um, There was a sense of complacency that had been born out of the, the very sort of easy political state of the 1980s and 1990s and that the the general sense that you had growing up in America that things were safe and that you know everything was just kind of 
uh, going well, mm -hmm. you know, that we were leading the world and things were going well. And, you know, uh, you, you hit the turn of the century. Um, there was the election that got decided 5-4 in the Supreme Court, and I think that was a big problem. And you know that in Florida, the, the election was decided by less than 600 votes. And um, the idea that Andy had was, listen, all of these things are, are telling us one thing. We need to engage the people in this music scene. We have a platform here. You have a platform. You have friends who are in other bands. So we called uh, Al Schneer from Mo. He called Bob Weir. And, uh, and, and we put this thing together there. And the idea basically was just to use the power of music to engage people in the process of democracy and the political process. And the easiest way to do that in a nonpartisan way where you're not going to be divisive and you're going to include everybody was just to register people to vote and then to get out the vote initiatives. And we started with a stack of clipboards and a stack of voter registration forms. Um, one of uh, a, a fan from the Disco Biscuit scene built us an intranet and a, and, and, we, and a website and we uh, got out on in 2004 on Fish Tour and Dave Matthews Band Tour uh, and Pat Patrick Jordan was really helpful with it, getting us onto Dave Matthews Band Tour and uh, we were on the Dead Tour and the rest is history and we've spent the le really the the last 14 years one voter at a time registering from that first voter all the way to where we just cracked half a million registrations. Yeah, uh, we've done 75,000 this year, which is by far and away the most that we've ever done in a non-presidential election year. Um, and we're seeing bigger numbers for more engagement for this midterm than we've seen in any of the midterm elections uh, that we've had since Headcount started. But I would urge everybody to not look at those numbers, to not read the news stories and necessarily believe it. You have to get up, you have to leave your house, and you have to go vote, and it's just coming up on Tuesday. This is the most important day of the year. Last night may have been the most important day of the fish year. <laughs> Next Tuesday is the most important day of uh, the year for the United States of America and our, the future of our democracy. Please vote. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Yeah, and thanks for all your work. I mean, it's amazing. Every You can go to any sh live music show, festival, and you see headcount. The clipboards are still there, and people are out there. And um, it's Andy and, and you guys, the whole team, has done such an incredible job. It's really cool. Um, any last questions for Mark before we let him go uh, on with his day? Yeah, uh, just kind of as a songwriter, it occurs to me that it's sort of like this with the gag, the, the second set, the implied accomplishment is kind of being overshadowed a little bit, I think. I mean, everyone knows it happened, and yet we haven't explicitly said that Fish wrote an entire album. And uh, I, I was thinking kind of the mask, you were talking about how important it is to be you know, not disingenuous and being yourself. However, of course, for the purpose of this gag, they had to step into an entire different personality, so to speak. When you are behind a mask, it's liberating, and you can do things and take risks. And I'm wondering, maybe they should do this every year, just come out with an album in a new guise, so to speak. Have you given any thought to like how quickly and easily this came out, and isn't it amazing? <laughs> I, I, I don't understand what they're doing over there. <laughs> like, I really can't, I can't. We've done gags where we've spent the better part of four, five, six months writing songs specifically for one event, where we had to completely clamp down so that nobody could know what was going on. You know, we did one where we wrote something called, uh, it, it was like in a, uh, a Broadway musical style history of the Disco Biscuits that we did for New Year's one year. And it, it, it takes a lot of work. To, like you were saying, just committing they they went so deeply and Aaron looked at me last night and he said they definitely made the stage look more white than we did when we did the white stage and we did a white <laughs> stage for our uh, it was the, for our history of the disco biscuits we whited out the stage and all and wore all white suits and the cords were white the camera was white I looked I was like hey man look at the camera <laughs> The symbols, you said the symbols were white. And then one last Outrageous. thing I want to say uh, that you guys were talking about on the panel earlier is the white guitar and the tone 
as soon as you said that, wow, it sounded like Trey. I was standing upstairs listening, and I wanted to scream over, it's in the fingers. Uh, <laughs> I was standing on a stage at Lollapalooza after watching Ween a bunch of years ago, and when the set ended, uh, Dave Drywitz, the bass player, walked over to say hi, and he said, uh, I said, hey, Dave, your tone, you got to talk to me about tone. What's going on with your tone? And he goes, oh, man, you know... It's all in the fingers. <laughs> and it's true. Yep. It's, you can, you know, any guitarist can pick up any guitar and it's going to sound like them. Yeah. That's amazing. And um, it, the one last thing about the, about the gag, which you sort of alluded to, Mark, is that airtight, you know? We were given misdirection and, and breadcrumbs, I guess, but, like, they're, the fish organization is so <laughs> airtight. It's yeah. incredible. We, we all, we all thought yesterday that they well, were going to play a, a residence album. Well, right, dates, right. one thing I pointed out last night was dates leak all the time, and real dates leak, like whole tours leak. And we'll look at it and be like, wow, that looks like the real tour. How did a whole tour leak, um, but this didn't leak? And, and, and the, the reason is, is because in a tour, it's, there's so many other elements. There's ticketing companies, there's venues, there's marketing people on all different levels in the venues right, that right, see that right. the, the place is held and the dates are just invariably going to leak out, especially in, in this day and age. Fish dates used to never leak out right. before the internet, <laughs> you know, but in this day and age, it's really hard for that stuff to be clamped down on. But the job that they did cl clamping down on last night was amazing. And, and I do want, I can't wait to go back and to re listen to it because yeah. hearing it and still not knowing, because the whole time, like you were saying, you did, this is your songwriting partner. Yeah. And yet, you were still it, trying to figure out while it was happening. Foreign yeah. enough that I kind of was convinced, like... It seemed is foreign. Is this real? Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> it's amazing. It was a, it was a, a, a feat yeah, it of was a artistic, uh, artistic Amazing feat. feat. Yeah. will be remembered for a long time. Yeah, well, for sure. Mark, thanks so much for, for joining, for taking time. Good luck with the shows and with Thank everything you guys, you, you guys got going. We'd love to have you back at some point. Um, and we're going we're gonna to let everybody get back to, uh, to getting ready for the, the show tonight. Um, thanks to all of our guests, Mark and Mike and Jesse and Benji. And thanks, Tom and Matt, for co-hosting this thing. Um, thanks to the Brooklyn Bowl Las Vegas. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And just one more shout-out. Thanks, Jonathan Healy and, and the Relics team for everything you do to help us get this out there. And uh, we'll see you all with more Couch Reports, uh, hopefully around the New Year's run. So um, enjoy the webcast, enjoy the show, and uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me.